institution and business development. So we have uh, our topic for lawyers in India, MS and our reality. And uh, I have with me uh, our speaker, Mr. J.G. Sefer, who is a partner of Walmart Maher and Richard New York office and handle complex U.S. and international litigation arbitration. J is a past chair of the federal and commercial litigation section of the New York uh, State Bar Association and is a co-chair of its federal judiciary committee. J is an adjacent professor at Fordman a law school teaching foreign lawyers obtaining their LLM on the management of US litigation for international lawyers, including the role of arbitration and mediation. We have with us Mr. Rakesh Sharma with more than three decades of work experience and rich exposure in the legal arena. Mr. Sharma is a practicing lawyer at the Supreme Court of India and High Court of Delhi. Mr. Sharma is the director of draft and craft legal outsourcing and the managing partner of Draft and Craft Law Firm, a global law firm dealing with multiple areas of law. He actively speaks and writes on current legal profession, trends and topics of general importance, be it legal or social issues. We have our th third panelist, uh, Mr. Sunil Talati, Chairman Service Export Promotion Council. He'll be joining soon. So I will ask Mr. Sharma, to start with his uh, session decoding the registration and regulation of foreign lawyers and foreign law firms in India. Mr. Sharma, you can take this ahead. Thank you. Hello, friends. I'm really thankful that uh, this journey of uh, the foreign lawyers commencing from a myth and moving towards a reality. I believe a couple of years back, maybe about 2008, when Draft and Craft was started. After that, we had a conference in New York relating to this similar topic, where we were discussing whether a foreign lawyers will ever be allowed to come to India. So that, that state seemed to be a myth. But now it seems that is becoming a reality. And I see the BCI rules coming in at this time, when India is progressing and moving in a direction where we see that India has to be a commercial hub in time to come. And the biggest hurdle in that was that when you do not allow the foreign lawyers to come along with their foreign clients, there is always a big roadblock. So the Bar Council of India at this stage came out with the requirements that how we can make this a precondition for introducing the foreign lawyers and the law firms to India. So I, I believe that uh, probably when we talk about it, we start with that what are the important conditions, requirements, requisites for a foreign lawyer that how do they come to India and what implications, problems are likely to be faced by the Indian lawyers as well as by the foreign lawyers and what are the gains we'll have out of this. So all this I'll try to zero down during this small discussion. 20 minutes is a small time, but I'll try to justify and envelop most of the things during this small period. Samir, if I can have the first slide, please. So we start with the prerequisites for the foreign lawyers or the law firms in India. When we see, we need to understand the first thing, what is a foreign lawyer? When we talk about what is a foreign lawyer, this means a very simple, that the definition of lawyers as per the Indian Advocate Act so far was confined more or less to the individuals or in India we recognize some lawyers forming a firm. We never saw an LLP or a corporation or a company as a law lawyer. But here foreign lawyers, because we have to adopt according to the foreign lawyers, law firms in international level. So we see in other countries, 
if a lawyer doesn't mean an individual or just a firm there are foreign law firms which are in the form of an llp or a corporation or a company so the definition of foreign lawyer has been widened beyond what it is in the indian advocate act so according to the rule 2 it defines foreign lawyers that it includes not just the individual lawyers law firms it also includes the llps limited liability partnerships companies or any corporation or in any way the structure they have but this condition is very important that they should be entitled to practice law in the foreign country from the country of their origin so foreign lawyer is understood in a very simple way an organization or an entity an individual or a group of individual which can practice in their country as a lawyer are considered and as foreign lawyer vis a vis indian laws are concerned then what is the next requisites that how those foreign lawyers can come over to india and what are the primary conditions primary condition comes with when we talk about reciprocity so if we see uk us these countries have already incorporated the provisions of having the international lawyers in their countries so if we see they are in reciprocation allow or any other country if that country allows indian lawyers in the identical capacity to represent for their clients in those countries this reciprocity is returned back by the bci that the lawyers foreign lawyers coming from those countries can come to india and practice now the foreign lawyers qualification is very simple as i have stated that they should be the lawyers who can be entitled who are authorized according to their own regulatory bodies to practice in their countries of origin so these are the primary conditions laid down under the rule 2 which defines it and thereafter let's move on to what are the conditions of practice now this rule 3 very vividly explains that what are the conditions for the practice so that means if you want to come to an india you can have the privileges of getting registered and practice in india so it is mandatory that whatever whichever law firm foreign law firm comes to india they need to go ahead for the registration with the bar council of india according to the different norms the simple requisitions are required the registration fee is required so this is the first part because you will be recognized mandatorily by the bci only and only if you are a lawyer in your country of origin so if you are qualified to practice in your country you can come to bar council of india and get your itself registered so once registered you are eligible to practice in india and uh, then we see that uh, once a bar council has given you a license or authorized or you are being given a permission to practice in india then we have to understand that what do we as a foreign lawyer we earn out of being given this kind of registration by bci so let's see what's allowed and what's not allowed very simple so the first distinction we have made or we have seen in the bci rules is that we have divided the entire advocacy in two parts this division is become visible for the first time in india we see that bci has said that you can handle all non litigious matters so no litigious matters the parallel so any lawyer or the law firm 
which gets authorized by the BCI can handle all the non-litigious matters. And when we talk about the litigious matters, that means the court litigation appearing in the cases before any forum or like this, and then it narrows down further that how we can go ahead to lay down that what, what are those forums or the courts will come to that a little later. Then we talk about work related to the laws of foreign country. Now, this is again something very important to understand. A foreign lawyer or a foreign law firm, I think I'll remain on the previous slide, please. Yes, thank you. So they, they have to be there for the work related to laws of foreign country. Now, if a foreign lawyer comes to India, he can advise their foreign clients in respect of the laws of their country, which are being going to be used while entering into any merger, acquisition, or any kind of contracts. So they can provide all their advice, legal expertise to their clients. At the same time, as a lawyer, they can appear before authorities wherever the evidence are not recorded. So that means they may not be appearing before the courts. They cannot represent in the courts because evidence is held over there in all the tribunals or all the authorities where which authorities or the courts have the ability or the mandate to call for the evidence. So all the authorities where the evidence cannot be mandatorily asked in those places, the foreign lawyers can represent and appear for their foreign clients. Then it comes to provide legal expertise advice in any international arbitration case conducted in India, whether or not foreign laws apply a very, very important part. In past, we have seen that whenever there had been a contract between two people, one from India at international level, the other from coming down from the some other country. Now, the arbitration clauses, the jurisdiction could not be taken to India because you cannot compel or you cannot ask your other contracting party to come and sign an agreement with an arbitration clause in India unless He's got a freedom that he wants to bring his own lawyers from his country. So that major restriction has been removed. So if we enter into a contract with somebody sitting in a foreign country A, so he's got that option that they can still go ahead and uh, bring their own advocates from their country to India. So this is a major boost which to my understanding is the major change brought by these rules. Then another important thing, the lawyers, uh, foreign advocates, which comes from them pertains to that how probably they can open, set up their office in India, which was not done previously. So you could fly in, fly off, but you could not have your office in India you could not have your drafting and all those things done, piled up. You could not actually work while in India. So this restriction, once registered, goes up. So you can have an office in India. You can form an entity in India. You can have a, a kind of a subsidiary law firm organization or entity in India. Same way, it brings you brings you nearer to the Indian laws, nearer to the international laws being practiced in India. Now, another important edge what our foreign lawyers and foreign law firms get is again very, very, very crucial. It says that you can engage Indian lawyers registered. If there is an Indian lawyer, who is equally registered as a foreign lawyer, so you can engage them. Another very crucial part which we can see into this is that if a law firm comes from country A, 
they can enter into a relationship with the country these foreign lawyers so that means in foreign law firm coming from country a can have relationship with n number of other foreign law firms and they can collaborate to form a partnership so this is going to bring lot of opportunities for the foreign lawyers as well as the law firms now let me just go to the other part where we say that uh, they cannot get into the litigations and of course they are not permitted to appear before the courts as i stated that wherever the evidence are to be led and they cannot be they are not allowed to enter into convincing of the property related work because this is again an area a niche area where couple of our indian lawyers are dependent and they are practicing so in this area we often see that these lawyers are probably well working into those areas of convincing so foreign lawyers and law firms are restrained that they will not be getting into the convincing part of the indian forming okay sir please next slide now when i see that uh, opportunities for foreign lawyers in india i see that uh, mammoth business opportunities mammoth professional opportunities have come to india so this is i'll say if not the doors for the foreign lawyers being opened it is of course a good window being opened to safeguard the interest of their own clients from their own country prior to this if a country is client has got some issues cases litigations non litigations mergers acquisitions any signing any authority interactions still those foreign lawyers could not come to his rescue in india but these rules now permit once they get registered with the bci so they can go for the safeguarding discussing ensuring the entire compliances for their own clients so i see that the another edge they earned out of it is that they can open set up an office in india in past we have seen couple of law firms had opened their offices in india but for the judgments coming down from the honorable high court and the honorable supreme court of india those offices had to be closed at one stage even the rbi was to withdraw those permissions so that bar has gone so this is a very good step for the foreign lawyers and law firms and now actually they can collaborate with other foreign lawyers of other countries while being in india and they can equally participate in all the entire working relating to the international arbitration in india now probably my indian co brothers would be looking for that what do and uh, what are the gains we see for the indian lawyers now when we see this bar council of india rules as personally i see it i see it is a box of opportunities being opened now it depends on us of course particularly when we say relating to anything which concerns that uh, how we are going to talk about this box being utilized so the most important thing is that we see this as a very big opportunity so this is a big opportunity for the indian lawyers equally when we see this happening so my take will be that when indian lawyers will interact with the foreign lawyers the exposure is going to be immense this exposure to the world is such that we will be interacting not only within india equally will be getting an opportunity to travel to those countries where there is a reciprocity and we will have an opportunity to practice laws in those countries we will have a reciprocity in protecting guarding the clients we have in india we see lot of investments 
lot of opportunities flowing both way we have around 195 countries where we are interacting india is interacting for the one or the other cross border relationships so these 195 countries may be a big number but over a period of time we see that this is going to be a huge opportunity and this exposure for indian lawyer is going to yield mammoth results and of course we'll have a knowledge enhancement whenever we see that we cannot we are living in a world of globalization so we need to interact with the other co brothers of other countries so we are going to have lot of knowledge enhancements and uh, of course uh, something is going wrong so my take on to this would be that when we talk about it so another part from when we talk about the indian lawyers that they have another important experience that they'll be able to be working with the foreign lawyers because when we see that international arbitration the lawyer from coming down from country a b c d lot of opportunities are flowing to india so we'll have lot of scope of growth of international arbitration so far international arbitration in india was trailing because whenever we had to go for an international arbitration so our challenge was that we could not probably go and see that uh, visit to the other countries were minimal so our opportunity remained very unexposed so we we could not travel to the other countries because international arbitration throughout was at a pace where we could not pitch for anything so my take is that if we can have the international exposure the scope of arbitration coming down to india is going to be immense and the last one if i see the opportunity for the indian law so we see that this probably is the opportunity of growth of getting engaged with foreign law. so so when we talk about it from my perspective somebody who did law in 1987 and uh, traveled a long journey i have seen that how i became an international advocate with the american bar association or the society of uk and wales so i have seen that what challenges you face when you have imposed restrictions in your house and you find that probably those restrictions are a roadblock in your growth in those countries so to my understanding the gains for indian lawyers are tremendous yes sir if we can have the next slide so when we talk about this probably i i understand that uh, uh, the indian lawyers and the foreign lawyers to my understanding is going to be huge potential so i'll put a uh, stop over here because i i understand that uh, my friend jg safar is going to take you to a wonderful topic that how this is a good opportunity and uh, what what changes he is looking for at the same time i'll just say that uh, please join this train of journey where it started from a myth and moving towards the reality thank you very much for providing me to share my view points so thank yes sir please go. thank you mr sharma now we have our second panelist uh, jg safer mr safer if thank you can... very yeah go please. ahead please go ahead thank you very much first i want to thank rakesh uh, and also uh, uh, danish if you know him at uh, uh, at the company um, uh, at draft and craft and also cigar uh, for their help and and asking me to share with you uh some of my views on how this new opportunity uh will will open the door for foreign law firms for foreign lawyers um for international arbitration what i did is when i 
when I was recently asked to participate, um, I reached out to people. I reached out to um, some of the arbitration institutions in Asia. And I'll share that with you. Uh, I, I reached out to the ICDR. Um, I reached out to JAMS. Um, I communicated with an India uh, practitioner. I communicated with US practitioners. And I think given the history of how this has evolved in India, there's now the opportunity to open the door so that India takes a place in the um, global economy, takes a place in, in that other countries have, uh, such as Singapore that Hong Kong had. Um, and it may, you may know some of the things I'm gonna tell you, but I was, I was, I was uh, surprised a little bit to realize what opportunities there really are. Uh, one thing, of course, to keep in mind is why, while there are other countries around the world, particularly in Asia, that have these international commercial arbitration hubs and international arbitration uh, centers, um, India, of course, doesn't have that because they did not have the uh, opening to uh, foreign arbitrators, foreign law firms to arbitrate in, Israel, in India. So let me start with some things I learned and you may not or may not know. Um, uh, the ICDR in, in India uh, advised me that India currently has consistently been the top flyer for arbitration cases. Um, uh, for example, the average number of cases um, from 2013 to, to 2018 um, was 58. Um, that's a lot considering uh, the restrictions on arbitration uh, that the that there was was not able to have certain things arbitrated by uh, foreign arbitrators in India. Um, now that this new law is coming to effect, and of course I'm not a lawyer in India and I can't give you legal advice on Indian law, but this changes the picture. Um, there seem to be some differences in, in, in who could do what free uh, opening of this law. Um, uh, but for example, uh, for your own interest, under the um, uh, Arbitration and Conciliation Act of 1996 in Section 11.1, foreign arbitrators could fly in and participate as arbitrators. But the ability um, of foreign lawyers to act as representatives of parties in India uh, was, was, was not available. Um, although there was, and I'll talk in a minute, in a few minutes about the case law uh, that may have opened the door. And you may have had your own experiences, but the problem is that most US and international law firms don't have the opportunity to represent um, clients in international arbitrations. And that becomes obviously difficult to create an international commercial arbitration um, hub. Um, uh, so that now that we're having this new opportunity, we're going to see how it's going to change. Um, the view was that the above policy change that we've talked about, meaning the, um, uh, the new law, will be helpful to international arbitration as fo foreign lawyers and that clients and parties will now be more likely, better likely, to choose India as a seat for arbitration. And that, of course, means opportunities both for international law firms, as well as opportunities for Indian lawyers, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, uh, the ICDR, the uh, now, even now, has um, uh, best friend relationships with hearing centers and facilities in India. Um, so that that's just one example of the potential um, for these international arbitrations, as well as ad hoc arbitrations, to, to be increased tremendously um, uh, what, what they're doing and, and how they're doing to do uh, arbitrations. Um, in the uh, JAMS, for example, I spoke to, um, India is one of the top five sources of 
cross-border arbitrations at jams. Can you imagine how this will increase once um, international lawyers are allowed to participate in arbitrations in India? When parties decide they want to make India the seat um, of, of arbitrations. Um, the new rules, uh, which is the text of the Bar Council of India rules for registration and regulation of foreign lawyers um, and foreign laws firms in India uh, in 2022, um, the objects and reason of the rule, I think, say a lot. What they, the, the BCI uh, said, look, the time has come to take, to take a call on the issue. The Bar Council of India is of the view that opening up law pra practice in India to foreign lawyers in the field of foreign law, diverse international legal issues and non-litigious matters, and in international arbitration cases would go a long way in helping legal profession and domain grow in India, also to the benefit of lawyers in India. So I just think the fact that um, you saw how many arbitrations there were already in India over the past few years in JAMS, um, that under the uh, JAMS, uh, that it was one of the top five sources of cross-border arbitration, that's just going to, to, to increase. Now, you may be aware that on March 19th of 2023, uh, the Bar Council of India uh, released a press release and they called it the true facts about BCI's rules regarding entry, rules and regulations of foreign lawyers and law firms in India. Uh, forgive me for reading more of it because I only have a little bit of time, but if you haven't seen it, it would help you um, clarify some things in your own mind. It said there's some misgivings in the circulation about the rules and the BCI wanted to clarify the issue and place the following facts or information of all advocates in the general public. They didn't wanna have misapprehension. They didn't wanna have misinformation. So it says foreign lawyers and law firms shall be allowed to advise their clients about foreign laws and international laws only. They would render advisory work about such laws for their foreign clients only. Foreign lawyers and law firms shall be allowed to function in non-litigation areas only. Foreign lawyers and law firms shall not be allowed to appear in any court, tribunal, board, before any statutory or regulatory authority or any form legally entitled to take evidence on oath and are having trappings of a court. Entry of foreign lawyers would be on a reciprocal basis only. That is lawyers, only those countries would be permitted in India where Indian lawyers are also permitted to practice. Foreign lawyers should, would be allowed to appear for their clients in international commercial arbitration, which of course is, is, is one of the real benefits of the law. And um, an experience in, in, uh, of foreign commercial entities in case of commercial arbitration, it pointed out, um, don't prefer India presently as a venue of arbitration proceedings because they aren't allowed to bring lawyers and law firms from their own countries to advise them in the international commercial arbitration proceedings, thus making them to prefer London, Singapore, Paris, et cetera, as the venue for arbitration proceedings. BCI, BCI rules will now encourage India being preferred as a venue for such international arbitration proceedings and helping it to become a hub of international commercial arbitration, which should be the goal, hopefully, of everyone in India, because it's going to benefit um, Indian clients. It's going to India, Indian uh, corporations. It's going to uh, benefit uh, Indian law firms, which will work with the foreign law, law firms and lawyers, and it's going to benefit foreign law firms. There was a case I mentioned to you that you might be aware of, uh, that's A.K. Balaji, I hope I spelled that correctly, I pronounced it correctly, B-A-L-A-J-I. And they came out and that was a result of years of trying to open up India. And in that opinion, the, uh, they came out with some suggestions as to how the BCI could arrange for entry and regulation of foreign lawyers and foreign law firms. And they mentioned international arbitrations. And so as a result of that, these new rules became, became about. Now, they're not 
it said it should be noted that this rule should not be misconstrued to allow any non-lawyer or any uh, agent to come to India and start practicing in any sphere and are under any trading style if it amounts to a practice of law as held in that case. And it said reciprocity is the very essence of the rule, which needs to be kept in mind. And of course, uh, they may know, obviously, a lot more than I do that uh, uh, Law Council of England and Wales, they have reciprocity. So I, I think that that clarification hopefully will be um, helpful to you. And you will be able to look at that to get clarification. Um, um, also, there's some other requirements in the law. Um, for example, uh, that aren't mentioned, lawyers will have to uh, to pay a fee of $50,000 US dollars in case of foreign law firms and $25,000 in case of individual lawyers. Um, the validity of the registration is open for five years with the renewal to be filed within six months. You can obtain the rules themselves, of course, which talk a great deal within the rules, for example, paragraph nine, about the benefits to India. Um, it was, they note that it will help to um, address the concerns expressed about the flow of foreign direct investment in the country and make India a hub of international commercial arbitration. Um, they said it's time for India, which is one of the world's largest economy, and will be opening to have this opportunity. And when you look at the case itself, the AK Balaji case that came down first in 2012, and you look at the large number of the US law firms that were involved in that case, uh, and not just US law firms, but international law firms in the UK, just to name a few, and I hope I don't uh, offend anybody by leaving them out, but there were uh, law firms like Kelly Dry and Ashurst had, a, had, a, had an interest in the Whiten case and Link Ladders and Fresh Bills and Allen Overy and Clifford Chance and Wilma Hale, Hale and Sherman and Stale, Sterling and Herbert Smith and Slaughter and May. I could, I'm just going on and on. Hogan and Artson, Davis Pope, Eversheds, Paul Weiss, Norton Rose, Pillsbury, Wilson Sonsini, Aaron Porter, Covington, Perkins Cole, uh, Lawyers and Law, um, uh, Clayton, Mayor Brown, Clyde and Co., Bird and Bird. Just they were involved in that case. They wanted to open up India and they presumably will be doing even more. So, um, as one commentator stated, um, as one of the fastest growing economies in the world, India cannot afford to keep its legal system insulated. It would provide a strong impetus to foreign investment and infrastructure development in India. And that's why it could compete and with other major uh, areas in, in, in Asia, for example, as I mentioned, Singapore and Hong Kong. Um, so I think that we're gonna see and hopefully see with, with this, as this law gets enveloped, as law firms make the decision to open offices in India that this will create a whole new opportunity and an opportunity to work with Indian law firms. Indian law firms will find, because anything that's having to do with engaging in the courts will require Indian lawyers. So that I think it's a, it's a, it's a win for India. It's a win for international arbitration. It's a, it's a win for law firms. Um, in, in India and outside of India. Um, so I hope I've given you a few things to think about. There's a number of articles that have come out um, discussing the law. There's a number of, um, uh, for example, the, the Law Society of England and Wales was quoted as saying this was a wonderful thing. Baker and McKinsey has been quoted as supporting it. Um, I think that uh, as you go forward, and as the next few months and the next year take place, we may see a whole, whole new a whole area in open India to offer new opportunities and, uh, and see that international arbitration litigation will grow in India.
So again, I thank Prakash for this opportunity. I thank uh, you for the opportunity for allowing me to to talk to you. You know, as a partner in Walmart Deutsch, um, Walmart Marin Deutsch, as an international arbitrator with the ICDR, and uh, <clears throat> as an adjunct professor, I teach foreign lawyers getting their LLM, including India. There are so many opportunities I see in all the practices I may have and you have. So again, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and I hope this was helpful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jesh. Uh, this was amazing. And uh, you have shared quite a good thought and view. Um, now we have our third panelist, uh, Mr. C.A. Uh, Mr. Sunil Tatlati, uh, Talati, and he's a CA. And Mr. Talati is a chartered accountant, has been elected as the president of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of India for the year 2008, 7 and 8, and is serving as the chairman of Service Export Promotion Council of India. He was elected as first rock track governor in India and then was appointed as national chairman of the Council of Rock Track Governors. He has written several papers on tax laws and has given talks in various seminar conferences and meetings all over the country. So over to you, Mr. Talati. Thank you so much. And I must appreciate the detailed talk by GSF Treffer and the way he mentioned with regard to tremendous opportunities being opened up in India for international arbitration. And I think Mr. Rakesh also said that. So there are restrictions mentioned that a foreign lawyer cannot come and practice in the court and argue. And he cannot, of course, learn the matters of criminal cases and other civil laws. But the area of arbitration is wide open. And as we have seen as a chartered accountant also in our clients, there are many accounting and other legal issues where we have to go to arbitration. And then we have to engage the lawyers who would go to France or Singapore. And there's a lot of inconvenience without very heavy costs. But the way now this, because of the WTO treaty, the Indian government has entered long back. It is really a very heartening news to know that yes, now legal professionals will be allowed to do practice in India, subject to various conditions as Mr. Jay very nicely pointed out. Now coming to the element of taxation, let me tell you it's very simple. I am going with the presumption that at present, yes, the foreign lawyers, maybe from UK or USA, Australia, Canada, or other European countries, may come to India because there are hundreds and thousands of Indian companies, and particularly SMMEs, small and medium enterprise, who have done collaborations, joint ventures, and agreements with foreign companies for manufacturing, for rendering service, for rendering expertise. We have professionals coming in India, for example, architects, there are people coming from Singapore and other countries building and designing various buildings. And we have other people also in professional area coming in India. So government was conscious about that. That is a non-resident who is not a citizen of India and who is not a resident of India, meaning thereby staying in India for more than 182 days in one year and more than four years over a period of last nine years, is a non-resident. And non-resident has to pay tax in India. So the first provision is under section 194 LB and 194 LC. They're under the Income Tax Act. So those who are keen may write down under the Income Tax Act, they have provision under section 194B and 194C, where it is provided that if a non-resident professional comes to India and renders services, tax will be deducted at source at 20%. Let me mention you that till 31st March 23, that is for just three more days, the rate of tax to be deducted, that is withholding of tax was 10%. But in the recent budget, which was presented on 1st of February with amendments approved last week in our parliament, from 1st of April 23, tax will be deducted and withholding of tax will be at 20%. Now, there are two issues of that. If a non-resident from USA or UK or any country comes to India 
and it does not have permanent account number. That is called PAN. In India, PAN is most important requirement for all taxpayers or from whom tax is deducted. So you have to apply for a PAN by which your identity and all other details are verifiable and cross-checked so that undeserving people or criminal side of people or those who are gen not genuine can be tracked. So if you are applying for a PAN and if you are allotted a permanent account number, then you get the benefit of DTAA. What is DTAA? Double Tax Avoidance Agreement. India has entered into double taxation avoidance agreement with number of countries. Where it's, as I mentioned by Jay, it is mutual recognition. If a foreigner comes to India and pays tax, he would get credit in his country of tax paid in India if there is DTAA entered into with that country and vice versa. If an Indian professional go abroad and render services in foreign country and he has to pay tax there, then he will get the credit of tax paid in foreign country in India while filing his income tax return. Point number three, a foreign resident is not required to file his income tax returns because from 1st April 23, he has to just file a form 10F if he has applied for permanent account number. So once you are established, your identity is there, you are allotted PAN, and if you file form number 10F, you will get the credit of 20% tax paid in India in your foreign country. So to illustrate, let us say in USA, in New York City, the rate of tax is 45%. Now, a New York lawyer comes to India and renders his arbitration or other legal services. And, and he charges $1,000 or let us say $10,000. So for $10,000, 20%, $2,000 will be tax will be detected. But he has to file the 10F. He has to mention that from this particular person against my this particular services of this bill, I have received 10,000 and out of which 2,000 is deducted. If that is done, then whenever he will be filing a return of income in USA, because balance $8,000 he can transfer to in his USA bank account, in New York bank account. So when going back to New York on 31st December 23, when he's going to file his return of income for the year ending 23, whatever the $2,000 he has paid tax in India, he will get credit in the USA. So in USA, he will be taxed on $8,000 at 45%, but having paid $2,000, he will get the credit. So we will have to pay the only difference. This is a fundamental principle of taxation. So there is no double taxation. A foreign national coming into India pays 20%. And then if he goes in his country, if he has to pay again 45 or 50%, in many European countries it is 48 or 50%, then the tax comes to around 60, which is extremely high. So that is why this DTAA, Double Tax Avoidance Agreement. So he will not be required to pay the taxation on the amount of tax paid in India. There's a fundamental exemptions and treaty benefits available. There is section 115A in two bracket one, into bracket small a, into bracket b. You'll be surprised, but yes, in income tax, we have 295 sections, Income Tax Act 1961 of India. But there are so many subsections and others, uh, a, b, c, d, that the total sections come to more than 485. It is one of the longest taxation act in the world. Be as it may, that's what the Indian taxation system is. But let me tell you with a very happy note, that now in India, everything is online. Everything is faceless. So you don't have to face any officer. You don't have to meet anyone. You don't have to consume any time going in any government or income tax office. Everything is to be done online. You can apply for your PAN also sitting in USA. You can file that form 10F also sitting in USA or when you are here in India and rendering your service. But the most important point or a point of litigation would come and for which again you uh, lawyers would be involved, that you don't come to India at all. Some, let us say Mr. Rakesh sends a particular matter to you in US state. And Mr. Rakesh would say, please give me your opinion. What would happen if my client does so-and-so in USA or has he has done so-and-so and now is facing so-and-so inquiries? And you give an opinion sitting in your New York office 
to Mr. Rakesh in India by email. And then you send a bill of $10,000. The services are rendered in India. Though you have mailed it from USA, though you have used or export expertise in USA without traveling or coming to India, effectively you have rendered services in India. And therefore, you are liable to be deducted tax. And therefore, when Mr. Rakesh has to pay $10,000 to you, again, he will be required to deduct $2,000 from tax deducted at source and send you a proof that he has sent you $8,000 by draft or bank transfer and $2,000 he has paid tax on your behalf, withholding tax. He will send the copy of that certificate, again, which you will be in a position to claim credit in US while filing your I-40 or whatever the tax return is. So this in nutshell are the provision of tax. India is in a very strong position so far as the double taxation treaties are concerned. There are hardly any disputes, but as very rightly mentioned by Mr. Rakesh in his initial remarks, there are a lot of litigations coming up, a lot of arbitration matters coming up because business has increased, transfer of goods and transfer of services has increased. There are problems with regard to understanding MOUs, understanding joint ventures, understanding agreement of sale, and number of issues. And on that, if a foreign lawyer is coming to India, I think Indian lawyers also can go to abroad and render services. Because I am mentioning at last that following this legal profession being allowed to be practiced in India, subject to certain restrictions, government of India is sincerely thinking to allow foreign chartered accountants to come in India and do the audit practice and other practice. Of course, as of now, surrogate practice is going on by big four, EY, PWC, Deloitte, and KPMG. But that is a surrogate practice. And the balance sheets are signed by Indian firms. But if foreign firms are allowed to come in India, again, the scenario will be changed. Again, that will be subject to MRA, mutual recognition agreement, reciprocity. If you are allowing USSCA, CPA to come in India and practice, Indian CA has to be allowed in USA and do the practice. So that is, let us wait for the time to come. I see a bright future for the professional service development in this area. And as I told you, there is nothing much to be bothered or worried about income tax compliance aspect. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Mr. Tawati, uh, this was a fascinating discussion. Thank you, all the speaker. Now is the time when all the speaker will be taking question. We have lots of question with us, uh, but limited time. So I'll be taking a few questions which I have received in the chat box. So his, okay, so Mr. Tawati, uh, Maybe uh, when CA is asking a question from you, uh, Mr. Joy, he is saying, sir, what can we as CA expect in terms of growth when it comes to these new changes? I'm sorry, I didn't get the question. Uh, he's asking, what can we as a CA expect in terms of growth when it comes to these new changes? Yeah, I mean, I tell you, um, with all respect to all other chartered accountant institute in the world, I can tell you with utmost confidence and with utmost humility at my command that the course and syllabus and examination standard of Indian chartered accountant is so strong and solid that any chartered accountant of Indian institute can easily go to foreign country and do the practice. And subject to MRA, Suppose he has to pass some two or three exams on certain papers, as we MRA with UK, an Indian chartered accountant can go to use and do the practice, provided he appears in the two more papers. In Singapore, you'll be happy to know that Singapore government has allowed Indian chartered accountants to practice in Singapore without appearing in any exam or any paper whatsoever, provided it stays in Singapore for a continuous period of six months. So Indian chartered accountants can do the practice outside India, and I see tremendous growth and reciprocity. And Thank secondly, you. with utmost respect, sorry, last one, uh, to foreign chartered accountants, the fees they charge on the hourly basis, on the basis of dollars or pounds, Indian chartered fees are much less. And therefore, chances of foreign chartered accountants coming in India 
charging fees of their level and getting practice would be more difficult. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jay, uh, we have one question from Amelia. Uh, she's saying, what are the chances of arbitration from other countries, including US, coming to India? Do we forecast major changes in, this, in the near future? Well, I think there are a couple questions uh, that can go along with that. I think arbitrators coming from other countries, even now, uh, as I mentioned, uh, there are matters depending on how they're appointed um, uh, in India and depending on um, uh, 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 on the fly in, fly out rule, and which is still in effect. It, this, this law didn't change the fly in and fly out rule as I understand it. So I think um, as more arbit arbitrations get uh, seated in India under these rules, I think um, more arbitrators will be be um, will be appointed. Uh, how whether that's because keep in mind that you have international law firms now able to to represent clients, and therefore they will they will have their own uh, desires and how they want to have arbitrators handling their cases. Um, so. I mean, some of the arbitrations done now by ICDR and JAMS, they use Indian lawyers. But the point is, even when you look at the decision that I mentioned, um, there are arbitrators and they can be appointed by, as I understand it, Indian tribunals. Um, but I think the chances of other countries having uh, arbitrators now involved in India are, are, are great. And I, I would think that uh, we would be able to forecast major changes because the parties in choosing their arbitrators will have different lawyers uh, and will have a, a greater number of arbitrators that they'll decide they want to have involved, uh, mm -hmm. particularly where one of the parties is, is, is not from India. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we have uh, one question from Sanjeev. Uh, I think this is probably uh, Mr. Sharma will come in. Uh, he's saying, sir, young lawyer already deal with a lot of competition with these changes allowing foreign lawyers to come to India. It just add to our rules. It is really a step in the right direction. He mean to say, is it really a step in the right direction, I believe? Yeah. I believe that probably by BCI opening this for the foreign lawyers, I don't see any competition with the Indian lawyers. Rather, I see that this is going to be a supplement because whatever the foreign lawyers are going to practice is they are not going to encroach upon the area of practice what Indian young lawyers or lawyers are doing. Rather, it is going to add to those things. For example, as I have stated while discussing in the beginning, that so far so good, we did not have the international arbitration, big merger acquisitions discussed and uh, settled in India. If there had been a big JV, those JVs were talked in Singapore or in London or in New York. But once you allow foreign lawyers to come here with their client, discuss about the JVs, so those opportunities are going to add in India. When we talk about international arbitration coming down to India, so the work is going to flow to India. It's nothing going to be eliminated. So my take is it is an addition of the opportunities. It's nothing going to be a competition to the Indian lawyers. Thank you, Mr. Sharma. Let, let me let me just let me just add also, um, and I would I would lo love to have which we could talk with some of the people asking the questions. Um, I, I can understand an initial concern that this will take away opportunities uh, for young lawyers in India. But on the other hand, it, not, not, it really opens the door in many ways to greater opportunities. Uh, the foreign lawyers still can appear before Indian courts. Um, if there is an arbitration and they need to go to court for something, uh, they, they will need Indian lawyers if they wish to enforce awards in India, um, they will need, uh, it would seem to me, Indian lawyers. And if those um, arbitrations are seated in India uh, and under some rules, 
uh, you can only seek to vacate, for example, uh, the, the New York Convention is need to, to vacate an award. You have to do it where the seat is located. So I, I think that I can understand there could be some concern, but I think um, the competition may still be a concern, but not, I think, in terms of the overall impact here, because when you have all these international law firms now, they're going to need help from Indian lawyers. Um, so I, I think that obviously I respect that, but I, I, I think I think it will be a step in the right direction. And I think it's been proven, uh, or at least I believe it's been proven in other countries uh, where, where you have foreign lawyers dealing with various subjects, including international arbitration. Thank you, Jay. Uh, we have one more question from Harpit Pura. He's an Indian and Canadian lawyer. He's saying, uh, and I think this question uh, is for all the panelists. There are Indian lawyers who do dual jurisdiction practice. How do you see the market for them with this legislation? Already answered. Okay. Uh, I think. Sorry, with respect, I think it's already answered by Jay and Rakesh in their earlier reply. Okay. So, Harpreet, I think uh, I, uh, maybe I will email you the content uh, if you were not there at that time. Uh, we'll take... I, I'll, I'll just add one thing to this answer, that when we talk about dual jurisdiction, probably this is an opportunity. Because we see that the dual jurisdiction means that you are a foreign country lawyer and also a lawyer in India. So probably you're matching up both the countries. So mm -hmm. this is a big boon in that way. Okay. So maybe uh, if, if there is something else, uh, I'll be sharing that information uh, via email. If you have, uh, I think we have already passed or uh, timing, but uh, if you have one or two questions, we can take that. Okay. Sagar I, Sagar, I can see one question on the screen before me. It okay. says that how are these new BCI rules different to the fly-in, fly-out rules laid out? So okay. fly-in, fly-out rules is very simple as said in section three of BCI, rule three of BCI. The proviso says any lawyer coming to India staying in India for 60 days in 12 months is counted as fly in, fly out. So somebody who doesn't own an office in India and is in India in 12 months for 60 days or less than that. So this is a very simple distinction they have made. So I think this question is very simple and the provisor to rule three explains it. Okay. If you want to, uh, uh, any other panelists want to uh, add a conclusion, a remark uh, to this uh, session, it would be very helpful for all the attendees here. And after that, we'll uh, take a leave. Any last? No, thank you. Tips? Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, I would just like to thank everybody again for uh, attending this. Um, obviously, if, if we can be of help to you in some way, I'm sure Rakesh would uh, like that. Um, or obviously, you can communicate with, with me or, 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 or sure. Mr. Lottie. So, so, so I, I think this is the kind of thing that would be fascinating. To, and there are going to be other conferences that uh, I think Rakesh is going to sponsor uh, to get the feel, to see in the next couple months how this plays out, whether uh, international law firms uh, take the opportunity here, and also to see how this really does benefit, uh, hopefully, India and the world market. Um, and if it creates what, what people hope, which is this uh, uh, international arbitration center like other countries have, this, this can only be a, a plus, uh, I think, for uh, international arbitrators and for India and, and for growing uh, uh, all the areas that that creates, uh, both for the international lawyers, for international arbitrators, and hopefully, and I think it's the hope that this creates for lawyers in India. Thank you, Jay. So anything, Mr. Sharma, you want to add? I'll, I'll just conclude that this journey has started 
which uh, the topic suggested from a myth to reality. So let's move on and be part of this beautiful journey and earn and learn a lot into this professional journey of the, our lawyer brothers. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Mr. Talati. Thank you, Sagar, for helping us and organizing this webinar. I'm sure that it has been a source of knowledge to a couple of attendees and a lot more to understand will continue. Thank you Thank very you much. Thank you from India. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. In case of any question or queries, please write us at info at draftandcraft.com. You have uh, the email in front of you. We got a lot done today. So thank you so much for your time and patience. Have a great day, everyone. And for some, it's, it will be a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.